Well, good morning. How are you guys doing this morning? Good? Yeah, I'm doing pretty good too. Doing pretty good too. I, I want to share something with you uh, that you might not know much about me or this thing about me. My name is Michael. I'm one of the pastors here at Cedarbrook. But there's something that I want you to know about me. And it's connected with this little game that we would play or this question you get asked when you were probably in like kindergarten, maybe first grade. What do you want to be when you grow up? Huh? What do you want to be when you grow up? All right, some of us, we had to answer that. We want to be a teacher, or we want to be a lawyer, or a doctor, right? Or we want to be a fireman, or a, a police officer, or things like that, right? You wanted to do that type of thing. Some of you might be still trying to figure out the answer to that question, right? What do I want to be when I grow up? I'm still trying to figure it out. Well, um, I just want to share with you the thing that I discovered in high school. I, I finally realized what it is that I wanted to be. When I grew up, what the way I wanted my life to be, the, the, the job that I was going to do. And I'm going to tell you right now, my parents were so proud when I told them this, right? All their prayers and their hopes and their dreams were going to be fulfilled because I decided that I was going to be a stand-up comedian. Not lying. I'm not lying. I'm not making this up. It's real. In high school, I, was, I had a communications class, and I was like, man, this is great. I got to be, uh, learn how to communicate, but I got to be f- funny in front of people, and I created these characters and, and, and did my public speaking and all of that, and I legitimately told my parents I was going to be a stand-up comedian. Right? I had this new thing with my faith and being funny in front of people and how I could you know, go and make people laugh. And I could draw attention not only to myself, but to also about who Jesus is. Could go into this world of, of people that uh, did stand-up comedy or they did uh, movies and things like that and in Hollywood or out in New York and things like that. And I could be Jesus to them. Like I had it all figured out how I could do that and be the stand-up comedian. I uh, went and did some stand-up. Of course, you start with open mic. Right, You do the open mic thing and do that. I partnered with a friend of mine named Joe and we put together little skits and things like that. We played at coffee houses. We even auditioned for this Minnesota State Fair. Um, So we did all of this kind of stuff because I was going to be the stand-up comedian, right? That's what I was going to be when I grew up. Life didn't turn out the way that I planned it, right? I I really thought that this was the direction direction I was going to go, that God was going to be able to be used and, and, and seen through this whole thing, and yet that's not where I'm at, right? I'm not a stand-up comic. That's not my life. That's not what I was called to do. There's something else that God had a plan for me. But I, I want to touch base. Like, how about you? How, how's your life, the way that you plan life to go for you? In kindergarten, Are you living out what you said you're going to be when you grew up? Is it life going the way that you planned it? Because oftentimes it doesn't, does it? Now, it could be silly like my little thing, but it can also be very tragic. You have a loss of a loved one, and it's not the way that you thought it would be. Living life without them or knowing you're going to live life without them. Maybe that the way that you planned your career and that you would end up being able to make enough money and retire when you wanted to and then you get laid off or your funds are washed away. It's not the way that you planned it. Or, or you'd never planned to be a, an addict and have to go through treatment. You never planned that. And yet here you are, you're living that life. What happens when life doesn't go the way that we planned? Is it really all about these things that we do or is there something more? A higher calling that we have on our life. Because this question is actually the very thing that we experience in this Christmas season. This whole message series about God being with us. What does that look like? What does that mean? And what does it look like when Our life does not go the way we planned. How is God with us in that? Because oftentimes we have this plan and we're just like, God, make this happen, right? And then it doesn't happen that way. And we have an example this Christmas season from this young girl who is in this small town and she's engaged to be married to this older man. 
and she is going to be found to be pregnant. And that child is not from her fiance. Just imagine what her community looks at her and thinks about her. Is her life a waste now because it's not the way that her parents planned this whole thing to be for them and for her and her community? And yet she approaches it in such a way that it reveals to us what is our highest calling, the, the main thing that actually overflows into the rest of the things that we do, whether you're a doctor or a lawyer or a you know, center of attention hog that's being goofy on stage, right? A stand-up comedian, all of those things. It flows into that, not from the reverse. So I invite you to open up your Bibles to Luke chapter 1 as we read about Jesus' birth narrative, and we're going to meet his mother, Mary. So go ahead and look, open up to Luke chapter 1. Uh, if you do not have a Bible and you would like to have a Bible and follow along with a Bible, uh, raise your hand nice and high. We have some ushers back there that would love to get you a Bible into your hands, which if you do not have a Bible at home, you can take it with you or you can turn it back into the info desk um, on your way out. Or you can go to cedarbrook.info and click on notes. Cedarbrook.info, click on notes. It's got all the scripture we're going to go through today, as well as some study questions and um, some other resources that can help you along the way. Um, now, just to set this up, uh, in connection from last week, we read about Zachariah and Elizabeth, uh, an old couple that were uh, going to have this child. Like this angel appears to Zachariah in Jerusalem in the temple. Uh, as he's serving, and tells him what's going to happen. And we remember Zechariah had a tough time believing that, right? He had a tough time with that. He's starting to doubt it. And, and we learned some things about it. If you don't, weren't here for that, go back and, and watch that message because you're going to see that it overlaps right on top of this. Like, it's almost the, the same script is written for Zechariah and, and how the angel appears to him and, and the conversation uh, and how it goes back and forth is almost the same with uh, Mary here as the same angel now is going to go to a small town north of Jerusalem in this little town called Nazareth and uh, appear to her and give her some news. So let's take a look and read about this. Verse 26 of Luke chapter 1. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. Nice little introduction. Now we get to see who this is, right? We're introduced to a small town girl living in a lonely world. I'm telling you, I could have made it as a comedian. <laughs> All right. But we're getting the introduction, right? We're seeing that this is connected to the previous story that's going to be overlapped in how they're going to engage, right? So let's hear what the angel has to say to Mary. Verse 28. The angel went to her, Mary, and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Don't be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you will call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will will never end. How will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin? A couple of notes here. If you compare the two stories from earlier in Luke with Zechariah, he asked a similar question, right? A little different, revealed more of his doubt. How will I be sure that this will be, right? How can I be sure of this? And she's asking, well, how will this be, right? It implies that she trusts that it's going to happen. She's just unclear about the process. Now, it's not just that she's a virgin, but think about this. She could think like, okay, yep, I know the order of life. I'm engaged to be married. I will get married, and then I will have children, and that first child will be born a son, and I will name him Jesus. Like, she could have thought that way, but that's not what she's asking. She's asking as if it's going to be fulfilled immediately, doesn't she? 
like right here, right now in her life, and she's not sure how that works. It's kind of amazing when you think about that. This, this young girl, just taking this word is like, it's going to happen right here and right now. Completely out of order from the way that she thinks life was going to happen for her. And she wants to know how. I would just want to know how it's going to be. That would help me. Now, the angel's uh, response to Zacharias question, right? Because he, he said, you, you don't get to speak, right? Remember that from last week? Uh, Zachariah asked, well, how can I be sure of this? And the angel goes in, well, listen to who I am, and I'm giving this message to you. And because you didn't believe the word I spoke to you, you don't get to speak, right? Till it all gets fulfilled. But the angel has a different response to Mary because it's implied that she's trusting this even if she's got a little bit of questions about how it's actually going to unfold. So let's take a look at what the angel says to her in verse 35. The angel answered, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age, and she, who was said to be unable to conceive, is in her sixth month. For no word from God will ever fail. What was the issue earlier? He didn't believe the word that the angel spoke to him. This word is going to be fulfilled, and the proof that you're going to see already is that your, your, your uh, relative, Elizabeth, who, who's too old to have children, is six months pregnant. So if God can do that for her, let God do that for you. And a little subtle thing that would probably be in Mary's mind is some of the words that are being used here. So she's very acquainted with the creation narrative, God's spirit hovering over this water and then begins to create life through God's spoken word. And we hear that here. The Holy Spirit is going to hover over you and create life within you. It's a really unique thing that's going to happen here. So she's got this on her mind. She's seeing how this can be fulfilled and hearing this about her own relative who was said to be unable to have children. He's yet going to conceive. There's a whole nother thing that, you know, they wanted to have kids and it wasn't working out for them and then God does something. And now here, God is working with this young girl in Nazareth. And what is her response? Life is going to go completely sideways on her. Thinking about how her parents might respond to this. How her neighbors might respond to this. Their community might respond to this. You're pregnant and you're telling me that it's not even from your fiancé, right? It's the Holy Spirit. That's a great story, right? Yeah, sure it is. How are they going to see her? Is her life actually going to be able to be an example of what God can do? Is this in any way going to, to honor God? Could, could her life now be anything but ruined, and a, and a stain for the community and on her family. That we have to put ourselves into this spot, right? These are the things going through her mind. I gotta be, right? But it doesn't seem like it. Listen to what she says in verse 38. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May your word to me be fulfilled. And then the angel left her. Didn't keep her quiet, didn't say he didn't do something here or there, right? Didn't have another discussion. He leaves her because she just says that I am the Lord's servant. May the word you've given to me be fulfilled in my life. Her life is going to go completely sideways. Not at all the way that she would have planned it. Her parents would have planned it. Her community would have thought the way it would go. The order of things. And yet, she says, yeah, let it be done. I am the Lord's servant. May your word be fulfilled in me. Right? May it come through 
in me. It, this is revealed in a song that she's going to see. She's going to go and visit her um, relative Elizabeth, uh, and there's a whole interaction. You can see that, but then she, Mary, sings this song. And, and this is where, as I'm reading through this story, it just, I stopped. And I had to, had to pause and go, like, if all the things that's happening in her life, even her response to this, like, I can get it. I, I'd love to be there. But then what she sings about completely blew me away. Uh, let me show you what she sings and tell you why it blew me away. If you skip down to verse 46, it's the beginning of her song. And Mary said, or sang, My soul glorifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. My soul glorifies the Lord. Now, maybe that doesn't make much sense to you because at first you're going like, oh, soul, I understand this is something separate from my own body that you know, goes on after I die and it's my soul and it goes on into heaven and afterlife and things like that. And that's not the way that they understood this. Soul here, uh, it gets translated soul, but it's often most likely translated as life. Right? So soul means life. Here I got a little slide for you so you can kind of see how this goes. So soul means life. And then glory is another word that we don't always use, but it simply means to make great, as the students here glorify, make great or to magnify. Her life is going to make God great in some way. Her life is going to magnify who God is. What? How is her life going to be able to do that? It's all out of order. It's completely sideways from any way that people would expect it to go. How can her life show God in any way? Right? Because it's all messed up. How does her life bring glory to God? How does her life make God great? How does her life magnify who God is? That's a tough one to answer. Because for me, anyway, I focus on all the things that I can do and accomplish. Right? All the things that reflect back on me. Am I living the right way? Am I doing the right job? Am I, am I being a successful human being? Right? And that foretells me that there's some way that I could make God great. Right? I could magnify who God is because look at what he's done all of these accomplishments that I've had. The funny thing about this is that uh, that's all secondary. Right? All of the things that we might think we could accomplish or do or become is all secondary to really the core, fundamental, highest thing we could be called to. Like, even for me, being called to be a pastor is secondary I thought being a stand-up comedian was a great way for God to get out into the people that need to hear him, and I had a whole plan about that. In fact, I wasn't even going to go to college or anything because I didn't need that, right? I didn't need any of that type of thing. And then I started sensing that God was leading me to a place of being a pastor. And so then I had to decide, well, what does that look like? What does that mean for me? What do I need to do to be a pastor? Because then I can show how God is in my life, right? And you know, the, the first thing I did is I called a seminary, right? That's where you go to, that's pastor school, right? That's where you go to learn how to be a pastor and things like that. That's what I thought anyway. I called them and they, the first thing they said to me was that, well, you need a four-year degree, I had taken time off of not going to school, and now I had to go back to school, go back to college, just so I could get to being a pastor. I had to take classes that were like catch-up classes. I paid the college to teach me how to do some math so I could then take college-level math. Like, they didn't even count towards my credit, right? My, any of that, right? I had to do that along the way. Does that make me, oh, man, look at how God was definitely called you into that and look at what you did to, to get there and to be this pastor and now, oh, we can see the fruitfulness of it. So clearly you are glorifying God. You're making God's name great. You, you are magnifying who God is because of that. That's not the highest thing. 
That's not the most important thing, this, this outpouring of what, what we do. It's secondary to what Mary shows us is that crucial, highest calling deep down within. The thing that actually magnifies God, that shows God to be great. The thing that gives glory to God. Do you know what it is? How your life can glorify God? Did you see it in her response? Her response is key to this whole thing. She says, I am the Lord's servant. Now that hits home for me, right? Because oftentimes I think, here's the plan, God, do this, right? That makes God my servant rather than having this attitude of humility that says, Lord, I am your servant. I don't want to go to college. I don't want to do all of these things. I want to do this way. Right? I have it all laid out for me. Make this happen. I am the Lord's servant. I will follow. I will follow your lead. I will go your way. I will do things the way that you have them laid out. Whatever that looks like, I don't care what it does for me or how I think it might bring glory to you. I start with the highest calling, saying, God, I will go where you lead me. The heart of it. So often, I think we get focused on the end thing, the thing that we can do, when really we need to start with that humble attitude that I am the Lord's servant. The Lord is not my servant. I am your servant. And that she wants God's word that's spoken to her to be fulfilled in her life. What a high level of honor, right? Giving God the greatest respect that the things that he says will be fulfilled through, what, through, through her. Like that his word is more important than her word. The, the things that he is going to do is more important than what she is going to do. That's the core of this whole thing. This humble attitude that the Lord, that you are the, the Lord's servant and that you want to give him the greatest honor that his words will come to life through your life. Then we can see the outpouring of what that might be. Then it can flow into everything else of how you live your life and maybe even the career that you do. But it starts first with that highest calling to follow wherever he leads. My invitation to you during this Christmas season for God to be with us here is for us to be intentional about our attitude towards God. That we can say, I am the Lord's servant. We are your servant, God. May your word be fulfilled in our lives. May our life glorify who you are. May it make you great, God. May it magnify your name rather than the other way around. That's the most important thing. That is the highest calling that we have as people who follow Jesus is to follow him. We're his servants. He is not our servants. I invite you into that this morning. I invite you into focusing in on your own attitude. What are the things in your life that you're like, man, if it would have worked out this way or had this plan and that where you lead me. I'm going to I want to bring honor to you through your word being fulfilled in my life. I invite you into this time now. Let's pray. Lord Jesus Christ, We get so mixed up in the order of our life, in the order of things, other people's expectations, our own expectations, our own plans, and the way that we want things to go. But we come here now, connecting with you, with the, the greatest way, our highest calling is just to follow you. Lord, we are your servants. And we will follow wherever you lead us. Amen.